All right. This morning, I want to just uh, take a few moments and talk to you about what the Bible teaches about healing. And this is such a broad subject, it cannot be covered in one message. Uh, cannot really be covered in a lifetime because God's Word is absolutely full of truth on healing. In fact, the ministry of Jesus was so prolific, all the things that he did and all the things that he taught. The Apostle John said that all the books in the world could not contain all that Jesus accomplished and all that he was to us. Not only is Jesus our Savior, but Jesus is our healer. Whoop, you missed a good opportunity to say amen. I said, God is our healer, Jesus is, and he's our soon coming king. Hallelujah. What great news that is. I heard about an old farmer that uh, went to the doctor for the first time. Doctor, he had a rash, and the doctor said, my goodness, this is really bad. Let's take a look. So he looked at it. He said, you know what? He said, you're allergic. You're allergic to your dog. That's an allergy to your dog. He said, you're going to have to get rid of that dog so his rash will clear up. So the old farmer was leaving, and his wife was with him in the truck as he was going home. She said, what are you going to do? Are you going to sell that dog or give him away? What are you going to do? He said, nothing. He said, I'm, I've heard of, uh, uh, you can get a second opinion. He said, I figure finding a doctor is a lot easier than finding a good bird dog. <laughs> we appreciate, we so appreciate our medical staff and community in this, in this uh, city of ours. We have some wonderful uh, people who, who serve in that capacity, the medical professionals, and uh, here in the church. And we're, we're just blessed uh, to, to know that God is giving an increasing wisdom and knowledge. And what's happening now medically is so far advanced above what it was 50 years ago or 5 or 10 years ago as it's changing. God is giving wisdom. How many know he's the, he's the giver of all good things? Every good, every good and every perfect gift comes from above. Can you say amen? So all that man learns and all that man achieves and all that man accomplishes could not be done without a divine God who's in control of it all. And so he gives wisdom to man, and a lot of that wisdom is to help us. And so when I pray for people who are in the hospital or people under do doctor's cares, I, I pray, Lord, help the doctors and nurses and support staff to, 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 to get this body in place where you can heal it, because we acknowledge you're the divine healer. Doctors can't heal. Preachers can't heal. Christians can't heal. It's, it's the power of God flowing through individuals. But we thank God for medical professionals who help us and get us to the place where God's healing can flow to us. We give God thanks for them. Now, when, we, when it comes to teaching about divine healing, I just want to say that we don't teach from our experience. We don't teach on, uh, from, uh, from what has happened in our lives, but rather we stand on the Word of God. If the Bible teaches healing, then let us believe it. If the Bible teaches healing, then let us practice it with confidence and with faith, can I get a witness, somebody? The doctrine of healing has its roots in the Old Testament. I'm going to take you through a number of scriptures today. We won't be able to get through all of them in one session uh, unless you brought a lunch. And so, so we'll just get as many as we can, and, the, and, 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 and I'm just going to hit some of them kind of rapid fire, so you may need to write them down, or, or better yet, if you have uh, the YouVersion app in your phone or on your tablet or something you brought with you today, Go to you version real quickly, and then search in your menu for events, okay? And then when you find live events, my notes will pop up. The scriptures, the, the bullet points from today's message, they're in there for you, okay? They're right there. You can follow along with me. You can add your own thoughts and go to the verses with me, etc. But I really want you to, this morning to take your Bibles and Open them and try to catch, try to catch me when you can. And, and if you can't catch it, catch it off the screen. Some folks like to take their phones and get this. You can actually um, screenshot the screen. Watch this. There. It took me about 5, 10 seconds, 15 seconds to capture that slide, what the Bible teaches about healing. So if this passage comes up and you can't get there quick enough or, or it really speaks to your heart, just shoot a picture of it. If you hold the phone up and you're shooting a picture, no one's going to think anything about it. If you're taking my picture this morning, I'll stop and pose every once in a while and let you get a good, the good side. Get my good side. Hallelujah. 
Father, anoint your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Let every heart be open. Let every mind be clear. Lord, whatever uh, we have learned or been taught uh, that is uh, improper or, or not biblical or, or out of some tradition that's not of you, then Lord, I just pray you would move that to the side so that we can hear your word succinctly and clearly. I, I pray, Father, that as I'm speaking today, that if I speak the truth of God, may it be as a seed in the hearts of men and women. If I speak of my own experience or my own uh, thoughts, then Lord, just let them pass from our memory. But let your word, your eternal word, find a lodging place in every heart. And for these things, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. 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 The doctrine of healing has its roots in the Old Testament. Although there are instances in the Old Testament where God sent disease as a judgment for disobedience and for sin, yet He has promised healing and health to those who serve Him. As a matter of fact, one of the promises of health and healing was in obedience. If you, if you get out of your disobedience and get into obedience, God says, I've got healing for you, even in, under the Old Covenant. For instance, uh, Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26 I'll bring that up for you, my very first uh, verse this morning. It declares, I am the Lord that heals you. Now look at it, here we go. If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in His eyes, if you pay attention to His commands and keep all His decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. You remember what He did to the Egyptians, do you not? We call them the plagues. They were the... They were the judgments of God upon uh, an, a hardened, unrighteous, sinful people. God says, I'm not going to bring those on you, for I am the Lord, your God, who heals you. Come on, somebody. And then he turns around in Exodus chapter 33, again, the Old Covenant, verse 25, and says, I will take sickness away from you. Look at it, Exodus 33 and 25. Not there, okay. Exodus 33, 25. I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. Deuteronomy 7, 15. And the Lord will take away from thee all sickness. Can you see that? He will keep you free from every disease. He will not inflict on you the horrible diseases you knew in Egypt. But, I will, but He will inflict them on all who hate you. God spoke to His people Israel this promise. And then Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 17 God declares, I will restore health to thee. So the Old Testament also reveals that healing is, is in the atonement. The word atonement we find in Hebrew is a word kafir, and uh, it's spelled K-A-P-H-A-R, and it means to cover, it means to appease, it means to forgive, it means to reconcile, this, this word atonement. It's mentioned 77 times in the Old Testament, the word atonement and healing of God, healing individuals is found in the atonement. It's found in the covering that God provided for His people. We cannot separate healing from salvation in the atonement. Go with me to Psalm 103, would you please? Psalm 103. Read along with me. Verse 2. Bless the Lord or praise the Lord, the NIV says. Oh, my soul. David here, the psalmist, is speaking to his soulish man, and he's saying, listen, I want you to praise God. I want you to bless the Lord. And I, I want, because he's the God, I want you to not forget his benefits. Now, to forget not really means to remember. So he's basically saying to his, his own self, this is a self-talk, if you will, he's saying, bless the Lord. I don't care what your circumstances are, bless the Lord. I don't care what you're walking through, bless the Lord doesn't matter what the doctor's report says. Bless the Lord. And, and remember His benefits. Remember, stir up your memory from time to time. Listen, we tend to forget what God's done. We tend to forget what God says. That's why we need to be in this book every single day. We need to remind ourselves of the benefits of God who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Everybody say, all your diseases. Hallelujah. Then Isaiah picks up this thought in, 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 in chapter number 53 of the prophecy of Isaiah. He says, 
speaking of Christ, He was pierced, wounded for our transgressions. He wasn't wounded for His own transgressions, Jesus. He's speaking of the Messiah. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed and bruised for our iniquities. Let me just take a moment and, and, and help you distinguish the difference between a transgression and an iniquity. A transgression is an act of your own will where you violate the law of God. God has spoken something clearly to us, and I, tend, I, I just want to transgress that, and I go against that, and that's a transgression of God's law. That's a sin. I miss the mark. But then there's this thing called iniquities. Now, an iniquity is something that uh, it, it, that I have a tendency toward. It's something that I have a proclivity toward. It could be, uh, it could be pornography. It could be alcoholism. It, it could be drug abuse. It could be bingo, 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 all three. It could be even more. Whatever I have a, an iniquity it is a tendency toward. It's, it's like the, when, the, when, a, when a tree is growing and it is, when the wind blows it, it's bent a particular way. You'll notice out in our uh, landscaping here on this property, we have staked those little trees as they started growing. We put some T-posts down and tied them with some wire on both sides. Why'd you do that for? Well, because the wind blows up here on this hill. If you hadn't noticed, we've already lost our, our big oak tree up on the very top of the hill by Kerr's grave and Kerr's cabin. It's gone. The oak tree is gone. I'm sorry. It, the last wind that came through here a couple of weeks ago, 90 miles an hour, they said, somebody, it took that oak tree and went, whoop, took it down. When it went down, it pierced the ground, and, and it spiked the sprinkler line <laughs> underneath there. And so uh, it was a Wednesday morning, and I got a call from, I think from Sherry or Daniel or somebody that said, Pastor, there's water running down the hill. And I said, what? So I came out, took a look. Sure enough, water was running down the hill. And, and so because the tree went down. Well, the reason we stake those little trees is to keep them from being bent. That's the same thought as an iniquity, how you have a, you're bent towards something. You see, we're bent towards a particular sin. There may be something that um, you're not even tempted with. I mean, it's just like you can walk right past it, and it's, a, it's, a un, it's unrighteous and unholy, and you don't even care. You just keep going. But then there's something else that you have a tendency toward. That's the iniquity. But I got good news for you. I have got good news for you. Jesus was not only wounded for your transgressions, He was bruised for your iniquities. He took your transgressions. He took your iniquities. He broke the cycle of sin over your life. You may say, well, Pastor, my grandparents did it, and my parents did it, and I've done it, and my kids are going to do it. No, they're not. That thing is broken in Jesus' name when you accept what Christ did at Calvary. So the punishment... Then finishing the thought, the punishment that brought us peace was on Him. And by His wounds, we are healed. We are healed. First Peter, uh, the, the, the writer, the New Testament writer, Peter said, by His stripes or by His wounds, we were healed. He looked back at the cross. Isaiah's looking forward to the cross, and Peter's looking back at the cross, and he's saying, Hey, church, listen, by His stripes, there's healing available for you. It's in the atonement. The healing work of Jesus is just as real and just as vibrant and just as alive today as His power to save. If you believe Jesus can save, then you need to believe that Jesus can heal. By His wounds, we are healed. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Healing physical, healing emotional, healing uh, in your psychological realm. Healing in your relationships, healing of your finances. Where do you need healing the most? I'm telling you, if you'll turn to Jesus, if you'll trust in Him, if you'll look to Him, if you'll call on Him, if you'll say, Lord Jesus, I declare today that Isaiah 53, 5 is for me. You were pierced for my transgressions, my sinful actions, the things that I've done. You took them on yourself at the cross, and you were crushed for the iniquities of my life, the things that I have a propensity toward, the things I have an inclination to do, the things that are nasty and vile and, and wicked in me. You were crushed for those at Calvary. You bore them in your own body on the tree so that I can go free from them in Jesus name so the New Testament then confirms the Old Testament prophecy the New Testament confirms the Old Testament prophecy for instance Matthew chapter number 8 and verse 16 declares 
he, Jesus, Matthew 8, 16, he, Jesus, cast out spirits with his word. Let's look at it. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him. And here's what he did. He drove out those spirits with a word. And then what did he do? He healed the sick. I said he healed the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, who wrote, he took our infirmities and bore our diseases. Wow. Now, here's, here's the passage in 1 Peter I was telling you about. It's the second chapter, and it's verse 24. And I've got it for you in the amplified version because when you amplify something, you make it really loud. For instance, if you amplify my voice, it becomes really loud. <laughs> Listen to it. Read it. He personally bore our sins in his own body. Jesus never asked anyone else to do it. He took it himself. I want you to think about that. He personally bore our sins in his own body on the tree as on an altar and offered himself on it that we might die or cease to exist to sin and that we might live to righteousness. You see, my friend, when you trust Jesus Christ and you are born again, you die to your sin. And you live to righteousness. Now, there are times when you may sin, yes, an act of sin, but you're no longer living in a state of sin. There is a difference between living in a state of sin where that's all you know and that's all you do and, and that's, that's your nature is to sin. See, sinners just sin. That's all they know to do. Haters hate. Cheaters cheat. Liars lie. Sinners sin. Don't get mad at those sinners because they ain't acting like Christians. You can't expect an unbeliever to live like a believer. See, and so when, when our lives are changed, we die to our sinful nature and we live to righteousness. Pastors, does that mean we're never going to sin? No, we're not perfect. We're not there yet. We haven't achieved it yet. So we will sin occasionally. There's sin in our lives. But the good news is there's a bar of soap. It, it's, it's God's bar of soap. It's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's bar of soap, 1 John 1, 9. That wasn't written to unbelievers and sinners. That was written to the church. That's for every believer under the sound of my voice today. If you sin, we have an advocate, John said, a, a lawyer, a, a, someone who stands in the gap, someone who intercedes. We have an advocate with the Father. The, the man, Christ Jesus, is our advocate with the Father. If we sin, and if we sin, we just confess our sin. We say, Lord, I agree with you. That was sin. I should not have done that. I, I am not a victim. I, I did it. I'm guilty. I sin. It's not anybody else's fault. I confess. That's what it means to confess our sin. When you confess your sin, you agree with God. I can't confess every sin of my life. I can't remember that. My mind is not that, that fruitful that I can remember everything I've done that was sinful. So we're not talking about confessing every sin, although it's good to confess what you know. The word confess really means to agree with. Is anybody listening to me out? I'm preaching good. Y'all either deep in thought or, or something. Come on now. Help me, pre help me preach somebody. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus. And, and all I have to do is call on Him and say, Jesus, I agree with the fact. I confess my sins. I agree with the fact that that was sin. When you say, no, that wasn't really sin. What I did was not really sin. It wasn't really my fault. It was the wife's fault. She pushed me to do that, you know. And who's the boss's fault? Listen, that's not confessing your sin. That's not agreement. But when you confess your sin and you say, God, be merciful to me. I missed the mark there. I blew it. I am so sorry. I confess my sin. When you do that, God is faithful 
and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If you will confess your sin, number one, one thing, one thing, confess your sin. God is faithful, one, and just, two, to forgive you your sin, three, and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, four. I'm telling you, that's a four to one kind of a bargain. God says when you confess your sin. So Christians need to confess their sin. Pastor, do you sin? Yes. Pastor, do you repent? Yes. Every day I repent. Well, not me. I repented when I was born again. I don't re- repent anymore. Really? <laughs> you, better, you better clean it up, Jack. You better get that, anybody named Jack? You better get that bar of soap and confess your sins because God wants to cleanse you from unrighteousness. Okay, back to this, back to this, uh, this passage. He bore our sins that we might live, to, we might die to sin, live to righteousness, by whose wounds you have been, past tense, have been sent, have been healed. By whose wounds you have been healed. Guys, listen. Physical healing was a huge part of the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Physical healing. Physical healing. It was a huge part of what Jesus did, his earthly ministry. Now, there's a passage I want you to remember from Hebrews 13 and 8. It says, Jesus Christ is the same. Come on, quote it if you know it. Yesterday, today, and forever. So the same Jesus that healed in the New Testament is the same Jesus that lives today. Pastor, don't you know that miracles passed away? Oh, they did? Don't you know Jesus doesn't heal today? Oh, he doesn't? Is he, not the, is he not the same yesterday and today and forever? Is Jesus Christ the same? Yes or no? Yes. Or for my Spanish-speaking friends, see si or no? <laughs> yes or no? So let's take a look at some of the healings of Jesus in the New Testament. Matthew 4, 23 4, 23 in Matthew, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing. Everybody say healing. Every disease and every sickness among the people. Matthew chapter 8, add verse 3. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. If you are willing. If you are willing. Now, leprosy was a, at the time, was a disease. There was no cure for leprosy. Leprosy would eventually kill a person. <clears throat> I understand it's a fatal disease, but before it does, there are years, sometimes years and decades of, of misery and suffering where, uh, where uh, your digits, your fingers and uh, nose and toes, other extremities literally wear away. They just rot. They just decay. Where... You, you, you lose the sense of, of uh, feeling in your feet and you can ab- actually stub your toe and break a foot and not even know that it's broken because you can't feel the pain. It's a horrible disease. And this man with leprosy came to Jesus and said, Lord, now first of all, he confessed him as Lord. Have you confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord? Are you a child of God? Then if you are, healing is, is, is the children's bread. Jesus said. It's for every child of God. And so this man with leprosy, this, this disease that was so, uh, so uh, rampant in this day that, that everywhere lepers went, they'd have to cry out, unclean, unclean, and people would run from them. They'd get away from them because uh, of the, the possibilities of contamination. They didn't want to be around them. These people had their own colonies, and to this day have their own colonies that they live in, and their own communities, and no one else wants to have anything to do with them. And he said, Lord, if you're willing, make me clean. And here's what Jesus said, did. First of all, he reached out his hand and touched the man. I want you to see this. This man had not been touched by another human being in I don't know how long. He needed the touch just as much as he needed the healing. And Jesus touched the man. There is a blessing connected with a proper human touch. 
I'm not talking about something that's impure. I'm not talking about something that is lustful. I'm not talking about something of that nature. I'm talking about blessing somebody with a pure touch. There is, there's power in the touch. And Jesus reached out and he touched him. And then he spoke and answered the question. The man said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. I believe that you can do it. I, my faith is in you, Lord. You can do it if you're willing. And Jesus said, and all the angels of heaven leaned down and listened. Here we go. What's the will of God? What's the will of God concerning a leper? What's Jesus going to say to him? He said, come on, say it with me. I am willing. Be clean. He's willing. I said, Jesus is willing. He's just as willing to heal you today as he was 2,000 years ago when he healed this leper. I'm willing. Be clean. And immediately, he was cleansed of his leprosy. I'm just about to get happy up here this morning. Now, we have a few more examples in that same chapter. So I don't know where we're at. I think we're like, what verse do we go to now? The next, I've got 15. I don't know what you guys have got. Whatever you've got, bring it up. There it is, five. Jesus entered Capernaum. A centurion came to him. The centurion was not a Jew. Jesus came first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. He came first to the house, the house of David. And, but here comes a guy who's not a Jew. He's a Roman. He is a Gentile. He's a centurion. A centurion would have about 100 men under his command. And he's asking for help. Here's this powerful Roman soldier asking for help. Lord, here it is again. Lord, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said, shall I come and heal him? Now look at his response. He says, Lord, I don't even deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority. I understand how this thing works. I'm under authority. I have soldiers under me. So I tell this one, go, and he goes. I tell this one, come here, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. This man understood the authority that Jesus had over sickness and over disease and over demons and over nature and over the earth and over the planets and over the stars and over all of creation. He probably understood that Jesus created it all. Woohoo! <laughs> there was not anything made but that was made through him. And so when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. And he said to the followers around him, he said, Listen, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great... I haven't found a single Jew with this, the kind of faith this, this Gentile just came to me with. I haven't found it yet. Now look at what he did, the next verse. He, whoop, we don't have the next verse. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> but, he, but he speaks the word and the man is healed. Come on, somebody. The man is healed. Now, let's take a look at another example. Same chapter, a few verses later. Jesus is still in Capernaum, and he comes to the house of Peter. Peter's mother-in-law is sick. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her. Like the fever just left my wife a few moments ago as we were praying. And she got up, and she began to wait on him. When I get home, my wife will probably have lunch ready for me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Another bologna sandwich. Thank you, Jesus. She loves it when I tease about that because she's a great cook. I, when I say she loves it, that's, I'm being facetious and sarcastic. She doesn't like it, but I love to do that. I love to say, another peanut butter sandwich, honey? She got up. This lady, Peter's mother-in-law, was healed of a fever, got up and began to wait on people. Then when the evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him. Here they come again, bringing these demonic people to Jesus. And he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. Next chapter, chapter 9, Matthew, verse 22. Here comes a woman to Jesus. Let me give you the context real quickly. She has an issue of blood. You've heard me preach about this before. You've heard others preach about it, I'm sure. An issue of blood. What's that mean, Pastor? Well, she's hemorrhaging. You ladies understand what that means. She had been hemorrhaging for years. 
not days or weeks, but years. She had to have been anemic. She had to have been very close to death. The Bible says in previous verses, this is where I'm getting this from, not just, I'm not making this up, but if you read the, the context before we get to that verse, you'll see that she had been to the doctors and had, 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 uh, had paid everything she had. She, every, all of her money. She was broke. She, she tried everything to get well. Can you, now, as I think of this story, I think of 2,000 years ago, medical science attempting to stop the hemorrhaging in a woman. They probably tried everything under the sun. I, I can't imagine. And nothing was working. So she heard that Jesus was coming to town. Listen, friend, Jesus is in this room today. He promised where two or three would gather in his name, he would be right there. Did he not promise that? He said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Jesus is in this room by the power of the Holy Spirit. This woman heard that Jesus was in town. She heard that Jesus was coming her way. And I'm telling you, faith rose within her. I pray that today faith will rise inside of you, knowing that Jesus is in this place to heal. And she said, she said within herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know that I will be made whole. I know it will happen. She said that within her heart, her self-talk. She, she said, I've got faith. I trust you, Lord. And she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, if I can just touch the hem of that prayer, uh, that prayer shawl that he wore around his shoulders and neck every single day of his life, that he would pull up over his head and make a, make an, a, a, a prayer place. A, a, we call them a closet. So a prayer closet. That's probably been transliterated improperly. But that's exactly what Jewish men would do. They would pull that prayer cloth over their heads and get in a private place and get in the dark and get alone with God and they would pray. And Jesus used that for prayer. But now it's around his shoulders, this prayer shawl. And at the, at the four corners of this prayer shawl, there's a little blue thread. And the blue thread represents the covenant of God. It represents the Word of God. It's saying, it's saying I, I believe that the Word of God is alive and real and powerful. And so she said, if I can just touched the hem of his garment, and she crawled. I'm telling you, she had to have crawled through the crowd. There was a crowd everywhere around her, but she pushed in, and in her anemic state, weakened and, and almost dead, she crawled, and she did everything she could to get to Jesus, and she touched the hem of his garment. And when she made a contact with that blue thread, I want you to know she was connecting with the written Word of God, but she also realized this is the living Word of God, Jesus himself that I'm connecting with, and she touched him. Him. And the Bible says immediately she was made whole. Jesus turned. Back up now. Let's back, whoop, back it up. Whoop, here we go. Jesus turned and saw her and said, Take heart, daughter. First of all, he said to his disciples, Who touched me? I said, What, what do you mean, Jesus? Everybody, everybody wants a piece of the action. Everybody's pushing and jostling and wanting a miracle and wanting to. They want to get close to you. They want an autograph. They want a selfie with you. Everybody wants, everybody's, what do you mean? He said, somebody, well, I love this. Someone has made a demand on my virtue. That's what the little woman did. I think that's the amplified version that says that. Someone has made a, a demand on my virtue. Is this resonating with anybody in this house? And so he turned to her and said, Take heart, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Next story. Jesus enters the synagogue leader's house, saw a noisy crowd, people playing pipes. He said, Go away. This girl's not dead. She's just asleep. They laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand. A dead girl got up. I said a dead girl got up. Matthew chapter 9, verse 25. I'm just trying to share with you some of the incredible stories of Jesus and His healing ministry. Go with me now. We're still in Matthew 9. Let's look at the next story. Verse uh, 26. News of this spread all around the region. Jesus went on from there. Two blind men followed Him, crying out, 
Have mercy on us, son of David. Again, they acknowledged who Jesus was. They knew who he was. They cried out to Jesus, I know who you are. He went indoors, the blind men came to him, and he says, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said, yes, Lord. We believe that you're able to open our blind eyes. Now look at what happened in the next verse. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. I said their sight was restored. So Jesus warns them, see that nobody knows about this. But they, they went out and spread the news about him all around the region. Disobedient, guys. I'll tell you what, if I'm blind and Jesus opens my eyes, I'm not going to keep it to myself. <laughs> Jesus, I'll try, but I can't. I no guarantees. <laughs> Come on now. I don't know about you. I, am I the only one getting happy up here? Am I the only one? All right, let's read, uh, let's read a little bit more. I think there are a few more verses in that chapter. Is that right? Matthew 9. And while they were going out. It's amazing, these, so many of these stories happen as Jesus is going somewhere. He's traveling here, he's traveling there, he comes up on a, a, a funeral procession, he comes up on some blind guys, he comes up on a demon-possessed guy. These things happen as he's just going about his daily duty. I want to say to you, while you're going about your daily duties, God can use you to bring healing. You can be an instrument of hope, you can be an instrument of life to those around about you if you'll only be willing to do so. Listen, when you go to Israel, they, they love to, to show you the steps of Jesus. You know, Jesus, he stepped on these rocks, and he slept on that rock, and he prayed on this rock, and these are the steps. But what's more important than the steps of Jesus are the stops of Jesus. If you'll go to the New Testament, like I'm doing today, and find out where he was going about his business, and he stopped. He always, get this, he always had time for people. He was never too busy. He didn't have the paperwork to do. He didn't have the job to get to. He didn't have the demands. He was always willing to stop and minister to someone who is in need. I want you to know this morning, Jesus has compassion on you. He's concerned that you're in pain. He's concerned that you can't see well. He's concerned that you're having trouble breathing. He's concerned that the doctor's giving you a bad report. He's concerned because there's sickness in your body. He has compassion on you. Jesus has compassion. Somebody shout amen. Wow. So he... He's going, and a man is demon-possessed and could not talk, was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute began to speak. The crowd was amazed and said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. You're right, pal. There ain't nothing been seen in Israel like Jesus. But the Pharisees said, oh, the Pharisees. They said, wait a minute, you're doing this by the prince of demons. That's how you're casting out demons. <clears throat> but Jesus just went through all the towns and villages teaching and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And as I read to you a moment ago, healing every disease and every sickness. He did not let the critics stop him from his, the purpose for which God had sent him. Okay. Are there any more in that chapter or is that, is that it? I don't know. I've got everything on the screen there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next chapter, please. Matthew chapter 12. Oh, here's one for you. Man with a withered hand. A man with a withered hand comes to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, stretch out your hand. And so he stretched it out and it became just like the other hand completely restored, just as sound as the other. There was something God was expecting this man to do. He asked the man to do something. You, to get your healing this morning, there may be something you need to do. If you're, if you're in pain in your back, something's wrong with your back, you may have to bend over like this and just see if God's healed your back yet. In fact, while I'm speaking and while faith is rising in your heart, God's healing people right now, even before we lay hands on people, some things are happening in your body. You may want to check your body right now. If, you, if there's something you couldn't do earlier, you might just 
See if you can do it. You may have to run to the restroom and, and, and look for that brace, take that brace off or, or that bandage or whatever. You know, I'm mean, listen, God is here today to heal us. This we're talking about the, the healing virtue of Christ. We're studying the ministry and the healing power of God that's found in the New Testament and the Old Testament. Whew. What the Bible teaches about healing. Oh my goodness, friends. Like I said, you can't cover it all in one session. There's no way. There's too much. Um, so that's a man with a withered hand. And then verse 22, there's a man who is blind and dumb. Now, I don't mean mentally. <laughs> I mean he can't speak. He's blind and mute. The NIV says that's even better. Blind and mute. Sort of like Helen Keller. You remember the story of Helen Keller? Well, they brought a demon-possessed man. Not only was he blind and mute, he had a demon possessing him. And Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. Somebody shout amen. amen. I hope you're not bored this morning. I trust this is not boring you. Come on. Come on. Let me tell you something. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you need a financial miracle, you need to get the Word of God and read what God says about blessing you financially. And faith needs to grow inside of you about finances. That's where it comes from. If you need uh, 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 help in your relationships, your marriage, your home, your family, you need to get into this book and find out what God says about your home and about your marriage and about husband's responsibilities and, and wife's responsibilities and how we're to love one another and work together in this thing called marriage. If you'll study it in the book, faith will rise in your heart and God will bring an answer to you. So this morning we're studying about healing, divine healing. Woo, hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Somebody's getting it, man. I'm telling you, somebody's getting excited. And faith, faith is rising. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, if you, I don't know if you've been healed yet or not. I don't know. I'm, I'm, Lord, help me to know when to cut it off and start praying. Come on. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just about ready. We're about ready. Are you about ready this morning? Mm. Wow. I said, wow. I'm going to say it backwards. Wow. All right. All right. Couple more, couple of more verses, and then we're going to have to land the plane and, and start it back up next week. Let me just talk to you about this thing called compassion. Can we, can we skip down a few slides back there in the booth, please? There's a, one slide that says, Jesus healed because of his compassion. Y'all see that? He healed because he was moved with compassion. Whew. Matthew 14 and 14 says exactly that. It says, he had compassion on this large crowd and healed their sick. The King James says he was moved with compassion. It's what the Apostle Paul described as bowels of mercy. He used, bowels is a euphemism. It's not really the physical bowel, but it is, it, it's mercy and compassion that is so deep inside that it motivates you to do things. Some of y'all have compassion for the poor. So you're always trying to help people with their groceries and help them with their payments and help them get them rides here and there. And just It's helping the poor. It's a, it's a compassion in you. Some of us have compassion for uh, young ladies and girls who find themselves pregnant and they don't know what to do. So we're moved with compassion to help them. Many of us, many of us in this room are moved with compassion to stop the, 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 the traumatic uh, events of, of abortion in our culture. We want to absolutely see abortion abolished in our lifetime. Man, I tell you, that's, a, that's, a, that's my heart. That's... I move with compassion there. I'm not moved with hatred. I'm not moved with anger. I, I don't hate anybody. I'm not against anybody. I, I, I'm, not against women. I'm not against women's rights. I'm not against women's health care. Are you kidding me? 650 abortion clinics in America, 13,000. 13,000 women's clinics where you can get health care in America without going to a place where they kill babies. 
So don't feel sad when a Planned Parenthood is shut down. Don't you dare feel sad about that. You rejoice with me because God's moving to abolish abortion. As, as, as it's, Listen, we have entered in a death culture. Well, here we go. Get up on it, Mickey. Preach it. We, we, we have entered a... We, are you trying to land the plane? <laughs> Come on up here. Come on, Sherry. Come, come on, Sherry. Come start, will you? Let's go ahead. Because if you don't, I'm going to preach all morning. And nobody brought a lunch, so... God wants to move America from a culture of death from 45 years of aborting babies. He wants to move us into a culture of life where we, where we hold life sacred and, we, and sanctified and we, we're thankful for every life, every human being because every human has value. Why do you say that, preacher? Because they're made in the image of God. That's why Satan wants to take them out. He's the thief that comes to steal and kill and destroy. He, I said he comes to kill. But Jesus healed because of his compassion. Matthew 14. Matthew 20. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Matthew 20, 34. Talking about blind people. Mark 1, 14, 41. He healed with compassion. Mark 5 and 19. He healed with compassion. Listen, here it is. Hebrews 4, 15. Be my final verse this morning. I'll, it'll be my first closing. First closing. I don't know how many we're going to have, but this will be my first one. Hebrews 4, 4 15. Or 16. There we go. Can we go? Can you go to 15 or just 16? All right, let me read 15 and then we'll read 16. 15 says, We have a high priest which can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Why can he be touched with the feeling of your weakness and your sickness? Because he has compassion. He was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Then here's verse 16. Here it is. So let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of